Hello everyone and welcome back. Welcome to the Bootstrap section of the course. Bootstrap is a very common framework used for front-end web development and it's actually going to help us save a lot of time from dealing with CSS manually. But first we need to ask ourselves what is a framework? What makes it different than just a library or some sort of package? Well a framework has a couple of key qualities. Uh, some of those qualities are inversion of control meaning you're giving up control to the framework and the framework is going to have some sort of default behavior and it's a non-modifiable framework code. And basically what this means is the framework is going to be defining the rules for you to follow, not the other way around. Usually we've been seeing ourselves write some code, defining the rules and then executing the code. Here the framework is going to tell you what the rules are as far as how you can manipulate the code. So there's an inversion of control there between what we're used to. And we'll get more used to this idea of what a framework is when we reach uh, Django, because Django itself is a web framework for Python. Now, a large part of Bootstrap is not memorization, but really understanding how to reference the documentation for your own use cases. And this section will focus on some of the more common use cases of Bootstrap, but the main thing to get across here is your ability to reference the documentation understand what you need to get out of it, and then apply it to your own website. Before we begin though, let's talk about Bootstrap version 3 versus version 4. So Bootstrap 4 is currently still in development at the time of this filming and will be released soon. Right now it's an alpha, so likely beta will come out after that, and then after that we'll get some sort of uh, first initial release. Now it may already be released by the time you're viewing this video, but if it hasn't yet, Bootstrap actually makes it really easy for you to use the alpha version or the beta version if that's out by the time you're watching this right now. So you can actually quickly and easily use uh, whatever the current version of Bootstrap 4 is while Bootstrap 3 is still the main release. For our level of use, the differences between version 3 and version 4 won't really be apparent to us. We're not going to dive so deep into Bootstrap that these differences are even going to be on our radar. Uh, while Version 4 is a major rewrite from version 3. We are really not going to dive deep enough to notice any of the differences. A few of the differences are things such as panels are now being replaced by something called cards, larger default font sizes, there's a new grid tier, the use of Flexbox throughout the version 4 framework, and a move from less to SAS. Now, a lot of these terms, if you're new to Bootstrap and new to CSS, probably don't mean anything to you and you have no idea what I'm referencing here. If that's the case, really don't worry about it. We're not going to dive into Bootstrap so deep in this course, nor will we need to, that we need to understand all these differences between version 3 and version 4. So again, the most important thing to get out of this section of the course is the ability to reference the Bootstrap documentation. So let's explore the documentation and see some examples of what Bootstrap actually looks like. The documentation is amazing. It's full of examples that makes it really easy to copy and paste and modify in your own code. Let's go to getbootstrap.com. Okay, so here we are at getbootstrap.com. You'll see a little banner here that says, oh yeah, Bootstrap 4 is coming. You can click on that if you want more information on version 4. But you'll notice that there's actually links on quickly getting started with version 4. Right now, it's in alpha, so who knows, by the time you're viewing this video, it may already be in beta, or it may already be on its first release. But let's go back and work with the current release, which is right now version 3. And again, for our use cases, either one will work fine for you. So if you click on Download Bootstrap, it takes you to this Getting Started link. And there's essentially two ways to use Bootstrap, as far as in conjunction with your web application. You can either download the source code itself, which is going to be uh, the font files, the source list, some JavaScript, etc. Or you can actually just use what's known as a CDN. A CDN is a content delivery network, and you can think of it as essentially working in a really similar manner to how we use Google Fonts. So Google Fonts API or the fontlibrary.org essentially allowed us to copy and paste a CDN link into our HTML file and then it just got the files over the internet. And that's basically what we can do here. We can see the links here that allow us to copy and paste into our HTML file to actually link to bootstrap code, which is great. You can see here there's the style sheet as well as some uh, compiled and minified JavaScript. And we'll be talking about this when we actually 
uh, open up the editor and start dealing with Bootstrap. But essentially we're just going to be copying these links. You can also manually download the links and then save them onto your computer and link to the local reference on your computer. But that just is a bunch of downloaded files that we don't really need. Uh, if you're trying to make your application self-hosted without any internet, maybe you're going on a train ride or something, you want to play around with Bootstrap, then you will have to download it manually that way. But if you have access to the internet, then you can just use uh, CDN. And if you're watching this video, then it's most likely that you do have access to the internet. Okay, so coming back up here, I want to explore the documentation a little more with you. If you click on getting started, it'll take you to this link. And you'll notice that beyond the download, there's uh, just basic information like what's included, which is right here, what pre-compiled bootstrap looks like. It's really just a bunch of CSS files, a bunch of font files, and then two JavaScript files here. There's the bootstrap source code. And then if you keep going down, there's just uh, basic information, basic template information, etc. And then there's some examples. So here are some examples of what the framework looks like. I'm going to click on these to open up a new tabs, but hopefully you can begin to see an idea of what Bootstrap actually does. So here are some very simple templates of what Bootstrap looks like. So you can see there's a nav bar here, there's some sort of theme example, and then there are some buttons here. There's also the grid template, which we'll be talking about later on. There's a jumbotron template. There's a narrow template, again with a jumbotron here, and then there's a navbar template. And we're going to be walking through a lot of these things throughout this section of the course. Jumbotrons, navbars, grids, those are all really common things that we are going to cover with Bootstrap. But for more specific things, if you scroll back up here and click on components, this will take you through basically all the components that CSS, or excuse me, Bootstrap has to offer. So if you want more details on, for instance, a navbar, you just click here on the side to navbar, and it has really great documentation. It'll tell you what the default navbar looks like, and then it has tons of example code. So this is an example of what this navbar looks like. So you can see it has a drop down menu, and we'll be discussing what this looks like later on. And then it also has the code for it. So you can always reference the code as well as what the code is going to look like. So if you want a brand image in your navbar, it shows you an example of what that looks like and shows you an example of what that code looks like. If you want forms, input forms in your navbar, maybe a search button, it shows you what that looks like as well. So you can keep going down here. Maybe you want to check out how progress bars work with Bootstrap. Well, you just click on Bootstrap here on progress bars and then you can see the basic example of what a progress bar looks like and it shows you the code for it as well. Then if you want it with a label, it also shows you that. So you can see that Bootstrap is basically just a bunch of predefined CSS styles that are really going to help you, and they each have their own class. And we're gonna discuss how to actually use these in a lot more detail in future lectures. What I want you to just get out of this lecture is the fact that you can reference basically anything you want about Bootstrap and see example code for it, as well as what it looks like, all on the documentation page. Okay. So the very first thing we're going to be discussing when we talk about Bootstrap is how to use these buttons, these really simple buttons. And you'll see that they actually already have classes defined to them. So very basic examples uh, look like this, left, left, middle, right, but they'll also have their own colored classes, which we're going to be exploring later on. All right, so go ahead. I encourage you to just uh, jump around the documentation and check it out. But coming up next, we're going to talk a lot more about Bootstrap and buttons. Thanks, everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to part one of the Bootstrap section of the course. A key feature of Bootstrap are its default classes. You can call these classes to quickly and easily build good looking features for your web application. We're going to be going over button classes as well as the container and jumbotron classes. First though we need to start off by showing how to connect an HTML file to Bootstrap itself. Let's get started. I'm going to open up my text editor to an HTML file as well as my browser and check out getbootstrap.com again. Let's get started. All right, so here I have my editor open as well as my browser. I have an empty HTML file that's linked to my browser. Let's get started by showing you how to actually connect an HTML content to Bootstrap. So I just typed HTML and got the basics going. And if you go to getbootstrap.com and click on download Bootstrap, It'll eventually take you to this getting started tab and you basically have two options here. One is to download the bootstrap files yourself and then link them locally on your computer. So you'll be downloading a CSS file and then you can link that locally just as we've done for other CSS files 
or you can just use the CDN, which basically is an online host for you to connect to. So you can just grab this link right here, and you can grab all of these if you want, but we're keeping it simple, so we'll just grab this right now, which is the only link we need for this particular lecture. And if you scroll down, you'll actually see there is pre-compiled bootstrap, bootstrap source code, but keep scrolling down, there's a basic template. So usually we'll probably end up starting with this entire basic template, which includes things such as jQuery and some JavaScript code. But right now we don't know enough about that to actually use it. So we're just going to use the very first link we saw here, which is the latest compiled and minified CSS. So if we zoom in just a little more, this is the link I'm using. All right, so now that that's ready to go, let's actually test it out by creating a heading one in the body. So we'll say, bootstrap exclamation mark and let's actually comment out with control or command forward slash the link to that style sheet just to make sure it's working so if I refresh this project.html it's linked to it I see bootstrap now if I turn the link back on and uncomment it and refresh notice what happens to the font the font changes to bootstraps default font and that is one quick and easy way you can tell if bootstrap is successfully working Keep in mind, you do need an internet connection for this to work. If not, you'll have to download the files manually. Either way, you're going to need the internet connection at some point in time. But if you're watching this video, it's probably because you have an internet connection. Let's discuss a container class. So I'm going to create a div tag. And right now, I'll leave it classless, but I'm going to add heading one that says, hello world, exclamation mark, save it refresh and I can see that my hello world heading is actually right against the left hand side of my browser so as I expand my browser it's still there on the left hand side what I can do to try to center it a little bit off that left hand browser is put it in what's known as a container class and what's really nice about bootstrap it basically comes with a bunch of predefined classes for you to easily call in your code. And you don't have to worry about memorizing all of these class names that we're going to be seeing. The main thing you have to learn out of this section of the course is how to reference the documentation, which we'll be showing you when we talk about buttons. But notice the hello world is now in the class container. So if I refresh this, I see that it's centered and down a little bit. So basically it just affected the margin spacing. And you can see here as I expand this window, or as I begin to collapse it more, it tries its best, best to say a little more centered or a certain distance off of the left-hand side of the browser, which is exactly what we want. So let's delete this now and continue on. Okay, now that we've explored the container class a little bit, it's gonna be something we explore a lot more as we continue through Bootstrap. It's time to talk about the button classes that are available to you in Bootstrap. If you come to the link getbootstrap.com slash CSS, which if I expand this browser, You'll see it here, it's in the top nav bar. You can just click on CSS. There is a right-hand side column here with some sections and click on buttons. And basically Bootstrap comes with some button classes that you can easily call, and you can call them on three separate types of tags. You can call it on an anchor tag. Remember, that's a tag with a link to it. You can call it on a button tag, something we haven't actually talked about yet, but we're going to be doing in this section right now. And an input tag, something we've used for forms but we'll actually be discussing forms in the next lecture. So right now let's explore using the button tag, which we haven't actually seen yet in action. Now the button tag basically allows us to create a button. Let me scroll back down to where we had the buttons. Okay, I just scrolled back down to the buttons and let's add a button in to our HTML code. So I will say button and we'll keep the type button and name button to be the default there. And let's say something like click on that button, we'll refresh, and you, now you can see we have a button here that I can click, but really nothing happens. And the reason we really didn't talk about button tags in the HTML section of the course or the CSS section of the course is because before we know JavaScript, there's not much we can actually do with these buttons themselves. Right now we're learning about them because of the typical styling choices you use with Bootstrap on them, but keep in mind, we won't actually be able to really activate anything upon the click of a button besides a simple connection to another website. But we can do that also with an anchor tag. It's not until we reach JavaScript where we're actually going to be clicking buttons and making things change on the web page. All right, so here's my button tag. Now let's discuss 
bootstrap classes with buttons. And this is basically the way you're going to be using the bootstrap documentation. I keep stressing that documentation is really important with bootstrap and I'm going to show you why. So we keep scrolling down on buttons and you see here we have options. So these are available buttons that quickly create a styled button. And there's basically just a couple default button types. There's default primary success info warning danger. And the way you utilize these classes with Bootstrap and the way you utilize Bootstrap in general is just by specifying class is equal to, and then you specify whatever class you want. So let's say if we come back here to our project HTML, we want to turn this click button into the style of a success button. So we just come here, look at success, and see it's btn space btn dash success. So there's button or btn dash success, save it, come back here, refresh, and now it looks like a success button. Great. So coming down, we can keep seeing that there's more stuff we can add. So fancy larger or smaller buttons, you can continue to add for more classes. So now I can add btn dash lg. So let's do that. I'll say btn dash lg to make that into a large button. So if I come back here, refresh, we can see that the button's gotten a little bit larger. We can continue down, see things such as active state. So buttons will appear pressed when active. We can also think, do things such as make it a disabled state. So if I want to make it look disabled, all I have to do is say disabled is equal to disabled. So let's copy and paste that. And that's actually another parameter or property of this button tag, but well, let's save it. And let's actually create another button so we can compare it to. So I will create one button, just copy and paste this that has disabled on. And let's say this is, I am on. And the bottom one will say disabled. And the one of has I am on, we are going to delete this disabled marker on it or disabled parameter. We'll save it, refresh here, and we can see the I am on, I can click on that. And if I hover over disabled, Google Chrome doesn't let me click on it. It shows that nice little icon that says this is not clickable. And as a quick note, you can always override these default styles. So maybe you like the success button, but you want to make the text a different color. All you have to do is in your CSS file, grab the btn, btn-success, call it your own class in your CSS file, and you could overwrite individual aspects of it. It won't overwrite everything, it'll just overwrite whatever aspects that you want to overwrite. So if you wanted to overwrite the text color or text background, you could do that yourself, just with your CSS, and just calling this class. So success, you could do that yourself. All right. Now let's finally talk quickly about the Jumbotron, which is something we'll be using a little bit throughout this course. So to view what the Jumbotron actually looks like, we're going to hop back over to the Get Bootstrap page. And let me expand this so we can see the nav bar. And I'm going to click on Components. And Components, as we scroll down, we'll see a bunch of components that we're going to talk, talk about later on, such as nav bars, labels, stuff like that. But you keep scrolling down, you'll see the Jumbotron component. And we see that Jumbotron is basically a lightweight, flexible component that can extend the entire viewport to showcase key content. So you can think of this almost like a landing page. And this is the most basic Jumbotron. It has some large font here, some large heading, some simple hero unit, whatever, and then a button there. So we can actually just copy and paste this and put it into our HTML. So we say hello world dot 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 is the paragraph. So we'll say something like this is the paragraph. Save that and let's actually see this now on our project page. Refresh and we see here now we have an HTML Jumbotron. Usually however you're going to want this Jumbotron to be within a container so it doesn't take up this entire page. What we will do then is put this inside of a container class. Grab this entire jumbo division or divider there, stick it inside, save it, and now when I refresh, I can see that it's basically centered like it was here on this page. 
And that's really the main idea of Bootstrap. You're going to come over here, see what you need. So if you want to know how to use an alert, you just come here to the alert and you can read the examples here. And you see here there's a class alert, role alert, etc. So, so far what we learned about were the basic button classes, which you can always check out by coming to the CSS page and then clicking on buttons and you can see the various button tags that are available to you. Then we also learned about the container class, which you can think of it as just basically centering stuff on your page. And then we also learned about the Jumbotron class. All right. Thanks everyone. And I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone. And welcome to part two of the bootstrap section where we're going to be discussing forms. A quick note before we actually begin to dive straight into forms of Bootstrap, I want to talk about Bootstrap in general for just a little bit. Many students get intimidated by Bootstrap when they first approach it. They think they need to memorize all the classes that we cover in this section of the course. Now that's actually certainly not the case. You want to think of this section more as a guide to the documentation and what's really possible with Bootstrap, not as an overview of things that you need to memorize. Even people who work with Bootstrap often or every day are going to be referencing the documentation a lot. What we really want to master here is the skill of gathering and applying information, not just memorizing information. Now let's continue on talking about forms. So Bootstrap comes with many default classes for forms. There's two really important ones that we're going to be covering here. And one of the first ones we're going to cover is a class called form group. So let's explore the various form components that we can use with Bootstrap. And we're going to be referencing the course notes quite a bit. So what I would suggest you do is to open up the part two underscore forms.html file that's under the Bootstrap folder. Okay, let's jump straight to our browser and to our editor to get started. All right, so here I have my editor open as well as my browser. And if I refresh my HTML here, right now I have it linked. So in my browser, this HTML is linked and it also already has the link to the CDN version of Bootstrap. There's an empty body. To get started, I just want to point out where we can find a lot of this information. If you go to getbootstrap.com, click on the CSS tab, and then click down here where it says forms, it'll take you down to a basic example of forms. And we can see here that we need to wrap labels and controls in a dot form dash group for optimum spacing. And when it says dot there, it's just trying to tell you that it's a class. Remember when we're dealing with CSS, we reference classes with that period or dot. So when you actually type in the class, it will just be form dot dash group. You won't actually have that dot there. So let's see this example, explore a little bit and see what happens when we wrap everything with a form group class. So I will copy this and there's actually a really nice copy to clipboard button there that you can just use. And I'm going to paste this into my HTML file, save it, and then check it out here in my browser. And we can see right now it stretches from end to end on everything. So what I can do to organize this so it looks a little nicer is put it all in a container class. And that's something we're going to be doing often when we use Bootstrap is put everything in different container divs. So let's paste that there, the closing tab, and then grab this entire form and just input it a little more or indent it a little more. All right, now that everything's in a container class, when I refresh, we can see it's a little nicely centered. So, so far it's looking pretty good. We have our email input, our password input, and we can see some more advanced inputs, things such as a choose file input. So if I click on choose file, we can see that it pops up something for me to choose file. Now, right now we actually can't do anything with this because we haven't learned the backend technology such as Django to actually accept that file and then do something with it. Here we can see just a checkbox and then the submit button. Now the key class I want to talk about with forms is this class form group. And what the class form group does is it put spacing in between components of forms so that they look nicer and they just read a little better. So to show you what I mean by this, I'm going to just delete these divs for the first two, refresh, and pay attention to what happens to the spacing here for email address and password. You can see here that they begin to get a little closer. And when we were dealing with our own input forms for some of the previous projects, we saw that we were using tricks such as adding in a break or adding in an empty paragraph to get that margin spacing nice. But all that's taken care of for you in Bootstrap, I'm just doing Control Z here, when you use the class form group. And then let me refresh here, and we can see the spacing is a little readable, more readable now, and especially between the actual blocks of the email address versus the password. These are just minor things that Bootstrap is helping you out with a lot by having those classes ready for you. 
And the next class I want to point out is this form control class that's in the input tags. So we have these input tags and we give them this class form control. Let's explore what they do by actually just taking them out. So there's my form control. I've taken them out and I refresh over here. And we can see that by taking out the form control on the input tags, basically we have what looks like almost normal HTML or normal CSS styling, I should say. Let's show one of them on this password input just to see the difference. So with the form control tag, I can see that it's rounding the corners. It's making it stretch the container size. It's actually highlighting a little differently. You can see that the highlighting has a bit of a, almost like an alpha or a blur around the password box versus email. There is highlighting there but it's not as subtle. And those are really the two classes that are making the forms look nice for Bootstrap. It's the form group and form control tags, or classes, excuse me, that you're going to be using on the tags. The div tag for each form, that's the label and input, it should have the form group, and then each input should have the form control. Now let's explore just a few examples of various different inputs that you're going to be using on a form. So I'm going to delete this entire form and then add in things from the notes. So I'm copying and pasting from part two underscore forms. So let me copy and paste the email submission example. So here we have a label input and we've actually already kind of explored this, but let's refresh. And this is a typical email address. So we have the email address, the email input. So this is where you would enter your email. And then you also notice that it says, we'll never share your email with anyone else. This is really common to have a little explanatory text in, underneath any input. A lot of times it's underneath an email address to give some sort of note like this. What we use for that is this small tag and we give it the class form text text muted. And it says whatever text you wanna say behind that. So that small tag basically just says, okay, a small piece of text here. So it's not the same size as a paragraph. So that's another useful tip when you're dealing with forms, if you ever want to give a little note there for a particular aspect of the input form. So that's a email submission. I'm going to delete that. And then I want to put in the password submission. Not too much to see here. Let's save it and refresh. And here we can see a password submission. Again, we've already seen this with Bootstrap. I'm going to copy and paste the next component that I have in the notes, which is a drop down select. So here we can see we have, whoops, the select form, and let's copy all this and indent it a little more just so it's more readable. Save it and refresh. And here we can see what a drop down form looks like with Bootstrap. So with Bootstrap, you get this nice interface, and we can see that it actually expands the entire width of the container. Again, there are ways to control that with CSS or just by editing the container itself, but this is what a drop down menu looks like with Bootstrap. If we want multiple select options, let me show you what that looks like. That has also the class form control here. So I can copy and paste this, save it, refresh, and we can see here we can have multiple selections. So if I want to select multiple copies, I can do shift and click. And that's basically another example of something very similar to a drop down, except now I can select multiple options. And the way you do that, is you say select, just like we did last time, but now you say multiple. So just to reiterate from the last dropdown option, which I'm going to copy and paste here for you to see. The first one, if I save this and refresh, is just a single selection. If I want a dropdown where I can select multiple things using shift or using control or command, what you end up doing is in the select tag, you add multiple. And that's just a keyword. Okay, so moving along, the couple more that I wanna show you are the text area with Bootstrap. We can delete these and put it in. Text area, it's also taking the form control. I refresh this and we can see a nice text area, it has those rounded corners. It has the ability for me to grab this and expand it. There's the file upload input. We actually saw that a little bit already but let's paste that in from the notes. We can see that it's also taking the class, if we look here, form control dash file. So that's another important thing to note. When you're dealing with type file input, you wanna make sure it has the class form dash control dash file. And the example here also comes with that small tag that we've seen earlier, which is some placeholder block level. If 
for help. So this would say something like, oh, please input your resume or something like that. Then you click on choose file and it automatically pops this thing up. Great. And like I mentioned before, we don't know yet how to actually deal with something when we upload it. We still need to learn the actual backend technologies for that. Now there's two more I want to show you, two more examples, and that is radio button examples with Bootstrap. So I'm going to copy this and we're going to see a couple new tags that we haven't seen yet. And those are the field set tags. So if we come up here, we can see we have a field set tag and it takes the class form group and we also have a legend. So let's actually refresh this and see what that looks like. So here we can see radio buttons and that's the legend tag that's making it look like this. And you can see, hopefully it's visible on your screen, but I have an underline here because it's a legend. And so we see option one is this and that, be sure to include why it's great. Option two, option three is disabled. So if you want something to be disabled, again, that's option three over here. You just put in a disabled call right here, disabled. All right, so nothing too fancy going on here. You can just check that there's classes for each of these. So if you want it to be disabled, you can say form check disabled as the class here instead of just form check. So here we have the class form check, which is really commonly used for radio buttons and as you may have guessed, check buttons. So we're going to put in a check button example here, copy and paste it from the notes. Paste it, whoops, let's get rid of that field set and that division. Paste it in here. So here we have class is form check, label is form check dash label. Let's refresh, see what this looks like. And here it just says, check me out. We can click, unclick, not much going on here. But if you wanted it, you can put in class form check. And that's really all there is to forms of bootstrap. So let's copy this entire form from the notes and paste it in so we can see what something with a bunch of options would look like. So I'm going to copy and paste this. And I copied everything, including the form tag. So I will save that, refresh. And here I can see a really large form example. So I have my email. I can see the spacing is nice between the various inputs. There's my password. There's my example select. Here's an example of multiple selects. Here's my example text area. Here's the choose file input, radio buttons, check me out, and then the submit button. And we can always color the submit button with different classes. So before we end this lecture, something I really wanna stress here is that you do not have to memorize everything that I just went over. And if it seemed like I was just quickly going over many examples, but not diving deep into them, that's exactly what we're doing for this section of the course. Bootstrap is just being able to see what's possible and being able to reference the documentation. So you have these notes available to you in your class notes. If you ever want to make a form with any of these, you can basically just copy and paste to your own needs, or you can always just check out the documentation that has many examples. So here we see a basic example of a form, but we can do things like a focus state, disabled state, et cetera, validation states. Uh, inline forms. There's a lot of examples and the documentation, it can be intimidating at first, but really it's all here to help you. Uh, it's just normal people referencing this and writing it. So don't ever be intimidated. And if you have any questions, post them to the Q&A forums. I'm always happy to help you out. Okay. Hopefully you now have an idea of what's possible with the forms in Bootstrap and that you're going to be using class form-group a lot whenever you're actually dictating that you have a form there. Okay. Thanks everyone. And I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to part three of the bootstrap section of the course where we talk about nav bars. Nav bars are those navigational bars that you often see on the top of a website. And we've actually already seen them on bootstraps' own website. And in this section of the course we're going to show you how to manually create the basics of a nav bar. So when we start out coding we'll actually code line by line a very basic nav bar. And then later on, we're just going to be copying and pasting from the course notes. And the reason for that is a lot of the class calls that Bootstrap uses for the nav bar components are really repetitive and kind of hard to memorize. There are things such as nav space, nav bar dash nav, and it gets a little confusing. And the naming convention is a little bit of a poor choice, especially if you're trying to memorize things. So we're really just going to be copying and pasting to focus on just accessing the information and learning what it does, seeing what's available with Bootstrap instead of memorizing how you could code out a nav bar from scratch. 
So we'll focus on just the basics for coding it out by scratch. Everything else is just going to be copy and paste from the course notes. So keep that in mind as we continue. We're also going to see briefly how to connect an HTML page to JavaScript and jQuery. And we haven't really discussed those two technologies yet, and we're definitely not going to dive into them uh, really that deeply at all in this lecture, but we actually need them for some functionality of the navbar, such as a drop-down menu being on the navbar, only really works when you connect the HTML page to jQuery and JavaScript. So again, this lecture, really not going to talk that much about JavaScript and jQuery. We're going to do that in future sections of the course, but we will show you now how to connect an HTML page to some online hosted JavaScript and jQuery codes. All right. Let's go ahead and get started by jumping straight to the editor in our browser. Okay, so here I have my editor open. I have an HTML file open, and I've already linked it to the latest compiled, the minified CSS of Bootstrap. And here I have my body ready to go as well. So if I come over here to the project page, it's linked up. First, let's check out how we can find more information about nav bars in the documentation of Bootstrap. So if we come up here to Bootstrap, you can actually see there's a navigation bar already on Bootstrap. You can see it says getting started, CSS components. So this is what a typical nav bar looks like as you begin to explore the page. And if you just come here to components, it'll take you to the components page. And down here, there's a nav bar section. So click on that and we can see some information about default nav bar. And we can also see that it requires JavaScript plugins for certain things such as collapsing and drop down menus, which we're going to be talking about later on. So here is an example of a nav bar. There's a brand, some links, a drop down menu, some search tools, link, and another drop down menu on the right hand side. And you can copy and paste this entire code if you want to take a look at all this. Instead, what we're going to do is start off by building out the very basics, and then we're going to add in components from the course notes. So let's show you how to just build a very basic nav bar in your HTML file. And then we'll start copying and pasting from the course notes in just a little bit. All right, so the very first thing we need to do is call the nav tag. That's the NAV tag. And that's going to be an HTML tag that we can use to actually begin to build our nav bar. And what we will do here is give it the class nav bar space nav bar dash default. And we'll be adding a few things to that class later on to explore a couple more things about it. And within this nav tag, I'm going to create a div tag, looks like that didn't take, a div tag here and give it the class navbar dash header. And this will actually be the header of the navbar, which is usually known as brand. So this is where your company's brand or the main name of the website is going to go all the way on the left. And inside of this, we add in an anchor tag. There's an href there, and the reason for that is usually when you click on that link, it takes you back to the home page. We'll just leave that as a hashtag for now, and we'll call it company. Let's save that, refresh our page, and see what it looks like. Okay, so here we see that we have company. However, right now, it doesn't look like the actual bootstrap company. So if we come back up here, we can see with the nav bars, if we scroll up down to nav bar, that brand usually looks stylized. If we come back here, this looks just like normal HTML links. So what we end up doing is inside of the anchor tag, add in a class called navbar-brand. And hopefully you can begin to see that a lot of the classes start with the word navbar, so it can get a little confusing as far as trying to memorize these things, which is why referencing the documentation is so important for this section. But now if I refresh, I can see it looks like a typical company call. And as I mentioned here, this href would usually take you to the home page, but you can really put in any link here, just like for any other anchor tag. So I can say HTTPS uh, colon colon, let's say www.google.com, save that. If I refresh this and I click on this company, now it takes me to google.com. However, right now, we'll just leave this as hashtag, and we'll discover later on how we can use the hashtag to link to different parts of the page. Okay, so we have our company brand over on the left. Now let's discuss how to add in more components to this actual navigation bar. So outside of that div, I'm going to create an unordered list. And an unordered list is how you add more things to this nav bar. And to make it look good, we give it the class nav space nav bar dash nav. Pretty repetitive, I know, probably not the best naming scheme, but that's how it goes. And that's why we reference the documentation for a lot of this. And inside of this unordered list, we put in list items. 
And then we give in anchor calls where just like the company or brand page, we could give a link to another page. But right now we'll just keep it simple. We'll call this item one, put another one in here with an anchor tag, and we'll call this one item two. And let's see what they look like now as I refresh this page. And there is item one, item two. They're links, so I could click on them to go somewhere, but right now they don't really lead anywhere because this href is just a hashtag. Now everything we've created so far is lined up to the left. If I want to add components to this navbar that are lined up to the right, I just add in the class navbar right. And let me show you by adding in a new unordered list and putting in the class, same as last time, nav navbar dash nav and then I add in here navbar dash right and then we can add in some more list items saying on the right save that refresh and we can see here we have it on the right but as I expand this I can see that it's kind of all the way to the right what I can do is put everything inside a container tag to try to balance that out a little bit so I will create div container, and this is something you'll find yourself doing often when you're working with Bootstrap, is kind of putting these container tags to contain things. Save it, refresh this, and now I can see this is nicely centered. So even as I expand the page from the left and the right, it's a little more centered around the middle, which is nice. Okay, make sure you don't actually wrap the entire nav bar on the container. Let me show you what happens if we do that. So if I wrap this entire nav here in the container, What's going to happen is the entire nav bar is going to be centered and it won't stretch across the entire page. So that's usually not what you want. You want just the components themselves to be inside the container. So let's undo that. Let's undo this. Great. So saving that, refreshing here. Now we have the nav bars ready to go. So as we continue, I want to briefly discuss keeping a nav bar fixed to the top of the page even as you scroll down. And in order to really show that, we need to add some more material to this page. So I'm going to just copy and paste this from the notes, but basically it's just a container class. So let's copy and show what this is. It's a container class with a jumbotron inside of it. it says, hello, lorem ipsum, lorem ipsum, another container, more stuff, lorem ipsum, lorem ipsum. So if I save this, refresh my page over here, I can see that I can scroll up and down but you can see as I scroll down, I eventually lose the nav bar. Now, so a lot of times that's how you want it. You want it so that you scroll down, the nav bar is no longer visible. Other times, you may want the actual nav bar to scroll along with you as you go through the page. So let me add in a little more content here. We'll do one more lorem ipsum, or let's do two more so we can really get the effect. Refresh this page. So we can see I have a little more to scroll down, up and down with. But the nav bar stays on the top and it disappears. If I want the nav bar to actually be fixed to the top of the page, even as I scroll down, I just come back up here to where it says nav class, nav bar space nav bar dash default. And I can add in this class call right here, which is nav bar dash fixed dash top. And this will fix it to the top of the page no matter if you scroll. So right now I haven't activated it yet. Let's refresh this. And you can see already the change is kind of obvious. The margin on the bottom went away. And as I scroll down, the nav bar comes with me. And the way to do that is just adding nav bar dash fix dash top. Another quick note on the nav bar, usually you will personally define the color using CSS, but if you want to stick to very basics, but you don't like the light color, there's a nav bar dash dash inverse class you can add in here. And this will essentially just make it dark and invert the colors. Okay, so that's all I wanted to show right now. Let's take these out. Whoops, come back here. Like I said, let's delete these, the fixed top and also the inverse call. Save it, refresh. And let's also get rid of all this junk right here, those last paragraphs. So coming back down, I'm going to get rid of what we added here just so we can focus on the nav bar right now. So refreshing this, I only have my nav bar. Okay, a big thing about nav bars, especially with Bootstrap, and it also has to do a bit with the grid system, is when you collapse it, it actually forms what's known as the hamburger. And if I come back up here to the components page 
of the Get Bootstrap site, you can see as I begin to collapse this down, I get this little hamburger icon. The reason it's called hamburger is basically you have two buns and a burger. And then when I click that, then I get the rest of the nav bar. But right now, you'll notice that even as I squeeze this browser all the way, I don't get the actual collapse of the burger icon. I just see the actual items beginning to reformat themselves, but I don't get the collapse. So let's show you how you can actually get that collapse in. And to do that, I'm going to delete a lot of, of, a lot of what we already have here. So let's get rid of these divs. And I'm going to copy and paste from the notes and then walk through that. So let's copy and paste what's underneath the collapsible container here. So I just copied and pasted a lot of stuff, so let's walk through it and explain. So as I refresh this, we can see we have this brand, link, link, and dropdown, but the dropdown doesn't actually work yet, and we'll explain why in just a second. But expanding this, let's actually show what I copied and pasted here. And this is all from the notes. So here, I have my div class navbar header, and we actually had that before. Then I added in a button right here. And basically we have this brand and toggle get grouped for what is essentially a better mobile display. And this is going to be the code that actually creates the hamburger icon. So right now I have this button call and it says class navbar toggle collapsed. So even with this already as a part of my navbar, as I begin to drop down, I can see that it becomes the hamburger icon. If I click on it, nothing happens right now, but I can see that it does collapse now that I've added those lines of code. So hamburger icon, as I expand, I get back the navbar. But let's explore what's actually going on here. So here's the code for the hamburger icon. And basically what it is, it's a span class that says SR only, toggle navigation, and then we have these three calls for the icon bars. And we can see as I collapse this, I get those three icon bars. I can add in more here. So let's make that four now. And if I refresh this, I can see I actually get four icon bars. And if I keep going with this, add in a bunch more, refresh, I can see I'm adding in more icon bars here. However, it's typical just to use three. So let's save it. So we have three, refresh the page, and we can see we have the three, that little hamburger icon. Okay, so this is the actual code for the hamburger icon. Again, it's just using the class icon bar and then toggle nav navigation. So that's all inside this button, where the button class is navbar dash toggle space collapsed. And then there's some more information here that you usually just be copying and pasting. All right, so that's all under the navbar header. And then anything inside of collapse, navbar dash collapse goes into the hamburger. And basically what that means is this. So anything any unordered list that you add in that's inside of a div with this class to it, collapse navbar dash collapse, is going to be collapsed into the hamburger. And to show you what I mean by that is let's add an unordered list outside of that. So I'm going to add in an unordered list. And just like we did last time at the very beginning, we'll give it the class navbar or nav space navbar dash nav and we'll say something like hello so let's save this and you notice hello here no longer goes into the hamburger so as, as I expand this I see brand hello link link and then a drop down menu then as I begin to collapse this everything that was inside of this div class that had collapse navbar dash collapse went into the hamburger Whatever was not inside of that, which in this case was this hello, happens to not go into the hamburger and basically details the same behavior we saw last time where it just gets squeezed down but doesn't actually go into the hamburger. All right, so that's what that class is doing. And usually you're gonna put almost everything inside the collapse navbar dash collapse unless it's really so important that you don't want it to go in this hamburger class. But it's really common just to put everything inside the collapse, especially for mobile viewers. The last thing we need to do, however, to actually complete this is if we expand back our menu here and we can refresh this, well, let's save this and then refresh. 
is we see we have the two links and then the drop down menu, but the drop down menu is not working. And we also noticed that when we collapse this, the drop down menu here wasn't working. And that's because we actually need calls to jQuery and JavaScript to make those functionalities work. And the way we're going to do that is in our case, we're just going to copy and paste from the notes. And later on, we'll show you how to actually grab stuff from jQuery. So you can either go to code.jQuery.com to grab this or just copy and paste it from the notes. But what we're going to do in our case is copy and paste this and put it at the very bottom of our body call right here. And what this is doing is it's copying and pasting a script call to jQuery. And this one is copying and pasting the bootstrap JavaScript. And if you went back to the very first page of get JavaScript, you probably noticed that there were some calls there that you could have also copied and pasted. So if bootstrap, when it said download bootstrap, as we scroll down here, we saw that there was minified CSS, but there was also this bootstrap JavaScript. So that's what this second line is right here. This bootstrap JavaScript, that's what I'm copying and pasting from. This other line is code.jQuery.com. That's actually a link to jQuery.js, which we're going to talk about much more later when we talk about jQuery and how it connects to Django. But for right now, you can just copy and paste these two lines from the notes, save this, and then refresh our page. And we should see now that the drop-down menus actually work. So here we have drop-down items. And as we collapse this, we see the hamburger icon. I can click on it, and now everything is working. All right. And if you want more details on how to actually add in more components to the dropdown, you can either check the documentation, which is really good, or just check out the notes. And you can see here that's basically just another unordered list with the class uh, dropdown menu. And then you can add in links, list items there. Okay. Thanks a lot, everybody. If you have any questions, feel free to post them to the Q&A forums. I know this was a lot of stuff, especially with these kind of goofy class names, but all I want you to really get out of this is being able to reference the documentation for nav bars and know what's possible with Bootstrap. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture.